Great, thank you so much, Cameron, and thank you everyone for joining us today for the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar from Dementia to COVID-19, Maintaining Innovations Using Data-Driven Program Decisions. The National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series is supported by the Administration for Community Living. At this time, I will turn it over to Erin Long of the Administration for Community Living for a brief welcome. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you for taking time out of your long, busy days to join us to learn from Jeff Klein and Peter Reed about the way they are maintaining innovations using data for their decision making. Um, we know this is a very important conversation and a very timely. So thank you very much for making the time and thank you to our presenters. So back to you, Sari. Great, thank you so much. As you heard, today's presenters are Jeff Klein and Peter Reed. I'll give a little introduction for each of them and then they'll get started. Jeff Klein has extensive experience nationally in healthcare management and consulting for hospitals, healthcare organizations, and community-based services. He is currently president and CEO of Nevada Senior Services Incorporated, operating a wide range of services for seniors and persons with disabilities, including adult day healthcare, care transitions, home modifications, in-home services, memory loss, and caregiver supports. As a consultant, Mr. Klein has been founder and principal at Altila Group and president and CEO of Premier Hospitals Alliance of New York. Mr. Klein holds an MBA from Temple University in Philadelphia and is board certified as a fellow by the American College of Healthcare Executives. He currently serves on the board of both the American Society on Aging and the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Program, of which he is vice chair. Today, we also have with us Dr. Peter Reed, who serves as director of the Sanford Center for Aging at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine and professor of public health. Peter has built his 25 year career as a public health gerontologist with a commitment to service and collaboration, bridging education, research, practice, policy, and organizational leadership. Previous appointments include serving as CEO for Pioneer Network, president and CEO for the Center for Health Improvement, and as senior director of programs for the Alzheimer's Association National Office. He is a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America and is active with numerous boards and commissions. Among other responsibilities, his current roles include supporting program evaluation of several ACL-funded Alzheimer's disease programs initiative projects, including the Nevada Senior Services Hospital Home Program. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Jeff and Peter to begin. Thank you, Sari and, and Aaron. Uh, let me first set the frame, because uh, it's an interesting notion about how programs evolve and where, where they head and why. So this particular program is uh, based on Hospital to Home, which was an initiative to develop a dementia-capable approach to moving people successfully from the hospital back into their homes and avoiding readmission. And in fact, looking at longer term approaches to using that process to ensure that even downstream, uh, we were heading off institutionalization. So built on the original bridge model, the uh, hospital home program, which was funded by an ADPI grant by the Administration for Community Living, uh, over a three-year period uh, and through multiple iterations, uh, found a pathway that, as you'll see in the data, has produced remarkable results and uh, kind of two two uh, paths towards long-term sustainability. One path was data-driven programmatic decision-making, and the second was the pathway to sustainability. And uh, as you'll see, this has been kind of a robust approach, none of which would have been possible without the kind of creative process that that first ADPI grant uh, permitted. And then by way of just a little extra connectivity, Dr. Reed was the independent evaluator for that project. So Peter really knows our initiatives extremely well and, and how that data flows. Uh, next slide. So if we, uh, uh, if we look at uh, how, what we're gonna try to do is, uh, we're gonna give you a real brief uh, introduction to Nevada Senior Services. I promise I won't take much time in Clark County and dive right back in to the evolutions 
of hospital to home from a evidence-based dementia capable transitional care project to embracing the uh, requirements in the COVID era, which ACL again was part of, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, moving forward into complex case evaluation. Now, let me say that uh, as you go through these evolutions, that in no instance did we walk away from the original dementia capability premise. So all our evolutions have been additive and cumulative. Uh, and I think you'll see that. But uh, I just wanted to say right at the outset, we still remain a uh, focused initiative for getting folks with cognitive impairments successfully out of institutions, back into their home and making those adaptations. And then uh, we'll take a look at how the caseload landscape uh, kind of evolved and then give you a chance to talk to us. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, sorry, and Aaron indicated Nevada Senior Services is kind of a broad based uh, regional uh, senior delivery system uh, offering care transitions models, adult daycare, in-home respite, a home modifications program, geriatric assessment, uh, a new set of initiatives in polypharmacy and implementation of COPE, our Care Partner Institute, which has evidence-based tools uh, that we bring to bear to help uh, our family caregivers in the community, and a new education institute uh, designed to partner with other institutions to deliver community and professional education. Next slide. Nevada is one of the fastest growing uh, communities from an aging perspective in the country. And our over 65 population is, uh, I think, either number one or number two in the country in terms of, of growth, in terms of the speed at which we're aging. Next slide. And uh, our dementia population uh, has also dramatically increased. And you can see it, it was the sixth leading cause of death in Nevada. Uh, that our uh, rate of uh, uh, deaths from dementia have increased 261% since 2000. And we're seeing those metrics just continue to, to multiply. And one of the fastest cohorts in the entire aging population here uh, is the most senior cohort, so over 80. And so we, while we're continuing to grow uh, the 65, 60, 65 plus generation, uh, we have a, a very significant uh, population of folks in the over 80 cohorts. Next slide. So that said, our first problem set, which was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, funded by ACL through an ADPI grant, uh, addressed the problem that persons living with dementia and their care partners experience in terms of interacting with the healthcare delivery system. And we all know from experience that uh, dementia increases the burden on acute care systems. And that's a very, I wanna just put an underline under that because uh, you'll see how that flows in terms of the evolution. Uh, second, it creates excessive resource consumption. Uh, folks with cognitive impairment need more than the average uh, patient in the hospital. We have higher complication rates and we get poorer outcomes. Next slide. So hospital home uh, targeted readmissions in the uh, ADRD space. Uh, and you can see that one third of all hospitalized persons uh, with Alzheimer's uh, we're averaging one and a half to two days in the hospital a year. The one in four of our care partners uh, end up in the hospital, which creates a whole second and third tier set of problems for the folks who they have at home. And then living, uh, people living with dementia are 40% of the total under 30 day readmissions, which is just a massive uh, component. Uh, and as a matter of fact, arguably, it's a higher percentage because these are 40% who have dementia in the record. And we all know that the vast majority of people with dementia who come into the hospital do not have it in their health record. Next slide. So 
to kind of walk through the success story. In 2017, uh, we initiated uh, a pilot that was uh, funded by the Nevada Aging and Disability Services Division uh, through an ADPI grant that the state had. And it was so successful that it led to a uh, separate ADPI grant for developing hospital home as a full-fledged care transitions model uh, for dementia capability in our community. The next step, a few years out, as that program was proving to be successful, COVID hit. And uh, we were in the last year of our ADPI grant, and uh, uh, we uh, actually asked Aaron if we could not expand the frame for our program to include people with uh, COVID-19 or were being impacted by COVID-19. And so that translation, that expansion uh, happened in 2020, and that was the first major evolution uh, of, the, of the program. In 2021, we entered into an agreement with Clark County to expand the uh, scope of resources available in Clark County, uh, not only countywide, but to target uh, some of the most difficult, intractable uh, situations in the county hospital, which is University Medical Center. And that led in 2022 to an agreement to target UMC and their complex cases. There's our third evolution that we'll be talking about. And recently we've had a dramatic expansion of the agreement. So programmatically, the program has evolved three times and you'll see how the data drove this. And from a sustainability perspective, the uh, original ACL grant uh, ended in 21. We now have a flourishing program that is evolving based on wider population served without, uh, as I say, uh, giving up on the original population, our ADRT population still stays at the center of it and has created a sustainability model, uh, not only for future evolutions, but for widening the base of the program. Next slide. So as we indicated, the first really big idea here was an evidence-based, dementia-capable care transitions model that would avoid readmissions, get people out of the hospital successfully, and maintain them in the community. Next slide. So our goals initially were to improve health outcomes and quality of life with individuals living with dementia, and we had objectives for creating the evidence-based care transitions model and a post-care transition set of services. Uh, within a broader community-based dementia capability framework. And in fact, trying to address the culture in the healthcare universe as well as uh, in the post-hospitalization uh, universe. Second, to offer short-term intensive respite or respite coaching to care partners for up to 30 days to provide decompression and resourcing and teaching to improve the likelihood that we would not get a readmission and that we would be able to establish long-term services and supports uh, for this fragile uh, duo of family and, and person with a dementia. And lastly, to provide dementia-capable education and training to the hospital staff to better service patients with Alzheimer's disease. And here we were all about not only imparting knowledge, but culture change. Next slide. So we were incredibly successful with that initiative. Uh, I, I will tell you, you'll see in the data that our readmission rate uh, in Southern Nevada for Medicare was at about 34, 35%. Uh, and our readmission rate for a hospital home was less than 1%. In fact, it was actually one case out of all the cases uh, we took on. That success and looking at how the overlap between COVID-19 and that 40% readmission rate was stressing the inpatient hospital system caused us to, as I mentioned earlier, to ask for uh, the ability to widen the frame so that we could take people on with COVID. And so uh, 
we found out how COVID had built on the capacity issue that we were already having in Southern Nevada for acute care beds and intensive care in particular, that we were having a hard time turning over beds. We needed safe discharge destinations for, for a, a stressed population. That uh, there was enormous complexity to post-discharge requirements, which you're gonna see in the data sets that uh, Peter will be discussing. And I just wanna, say that the initial models we had uh, for measuring and monitoring uh, discharge issues, requirements, problems, and ultimately resources has stayed post-grant. And that is the data, as you'll see from Peter's portion of the presentation, that has actually led us to make a lot of significant decisions about the future of this program. And finally, the overload from COVID combined with dementia led to workforce shortages that we all experienced during COVID, increased healthcare burnout, exhaustion, and trauma, all of which scream for a solution. Next slide. So that led us to the second big idea. Uh, how do we move hospital home into COVID-19? Uh, how do we evolve the concepts that uh, we had gotten very comfortable with? in terms of the way we interacted with the hospital community and the, and the families and the post-discharge community. Next slide. So our second evolution, the COVID-19 evolution, uh, we are looking at how we impact the environment, the healthcare environment, uh, with a translation that would take some stress off the hospital capacity. Uh, and move people out of beds into safer community environments. So, well, first objective was to solve the discharge destination problem that was impacted by uh, those patients who were getting stable, but we couldn't get out of the hospital. Many of whom, as you'll see in the overlap, also had ADRD. Second, reducing the length of stay to improve the turnover. And then lastly, to accomplish safe COVID-19 discharges, with an emphasis on making sure they did not come back into the hospital for the same reason that brought them in. So our population now became a dementia population plus a COVID-19 population, which as you'll see, uh, overlapped very significantly when we looked at the data. Next slide. So time marches on. And uh, as you, again, you'll see in the data, we started to confront the problem that uh, people had multiple diagnoses and that there were intractable, intractable problems discharging people with complex diagnoses and complex discharge problems. And uh, they could be uh, older folks with uh, aphasia, diabetes, pulmonary problems, cardiac problems, uh, and who had family discharge resource issues. So the hospitals continued to have a hangover from COVID uh, as our beds remained the capacity, but the mix in the population started to change. Second, subacute and alternate discharge options were a capacity and remained that way, despite the fact that the waves of COVID were somewhat subsiding that the community resources were already overtaxed, which made it more difficult to create wraparound opportunities to move people out of the hospital. And we were continuing to get poor outcomes in our healthcare delivery system. Next uh, slide. So the second problem set, how do we translate and adapt that second problem set uh, in a more complex case universe? And so, we recognize that COVID put a lot of stress on the system, that the hospitals remained the capacity, that uh, the bed turnover was literally keeping people from getting elective procedures, that the post-discharge requirements were very complicated uh, and difficult to achieve for this portion of the population, which also, as you'll see, included some subsets of populations, including folks with behavioral issues and with uh, homelessness, and that overload on the system continued to lead to workforce shortages, 
burnout, exhaustion, and trauma inside our healthcare delivery system. Next slide. So the next iteration for dealing with those problems was this translation of hospital home to complex cases. Next slide. So case mix shifts, meaning the overlap or change in people who had a primary diagnosis or identifiable diagnosis that was different from the population uh, that we were addressing before. And a lot of this shift occurred because of the waves, different waves of COVID hospitalizations. And those portions of the population which needed hospitalization and didn't get it, and now we're flooding back into the hospitals. The fact that family caregiver resources were on massive overload, a leftover from COVID, but also uh, that would have been the case without any COVID, as we all know from our experience with ADRD. We have very stressed family caregivers who frequently, by the time they get into a hospital setting, uh, started out stressed and burn out even faster, 24-7 uh, in the hospital, pre-COVID and sitting at home, frustrated without an ability to impact the care and be an advocate for their loved one during COVID. And traditional wraparound services were shot and overstressed and limited availability of resources for expanded populations such as the homeless and people with behavioral problems uh, started to crop up uh, on our dashboard. And discharge planners in the institutional environment lack the resources and caseload time to problem solve with this more difficult case population, which often means a lot of detective work. Finding that relative in some other part of the country who is willing to step in and help a uh, person who has a set of complex problems and is living alone and their only family member is 1,500 miles away. Finding that family member, working with that family to design, to design solutions, discharge solutions, uh, be, is just not within the capability of most hospital systems. They're just way too overtaxed. Next slide. So our iteration number three was complex case evolution, solve the discharge destination problem, and avoid issues like having to get attorneys in the hospital to uh, get a capacity determination so the hospital could move somebody out. But then having achieved that, they had no place to send them anyway. Uh, reduce the length of stay for complex discharges, which would take more stress off the system, but also allow people who are not getting service to get into the hospital to get service. And finally, to accomplish safe COVID-19 discharges, continuing problem while avoiding readmission within 30 days for the same diagnosis for an even more complex uh, combined population. So now if we can go back to the formula, our original ADRD dementia population plus continuing hangover from COVID plus complex cases. Next slide. So the impact of hospital home, the story is in the data. It's in the client demographics. It's in the shift to and through COVID-19. And uh, the uh, tool set that was originally developed by Nevada Senior Services and uh, Peter and Company at Sanford for looking at how we measure the outcomes and the shifts in outcomes in the population, including self-reported health status, depression, quality of life, the impact on the care bur partners, burden, depression, and quality of life, and the likelihood of a long-term care placement. Next slide. Peter? All right, thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, that overview of the transitions that have taken place in the hospital at home program and how you were able to use the data to drive decisions to respond to a changing landscape. And I think we're all very familiar with the, how the landscape has changed over the last several years, but in real time, you know, you were able to look at what was happening with the, the clients that you were serving and make adjustments um, to be able to broaden and expand that to where the needs existed within the community. So thank you, Jeff, for, for that overview. Um, I also want to just quickly take a moment and thank Aaron Long, 
uh, at ACL for uh, the opportunity to present today, and also Sari Schumann and her team at the NADRC. Uh, Jeff and I are delighted to be able to share the work that we've done within this. Um, so as Jeff shared, um, my role within this project really was the program as a program evaluator. Uh, and I should mention my colleague, Dr. Zeb Gibb, uh, who's the research associate at the Sanford Center for Aging, who really analyzed and developed analyzed the data and developed these reports. He has subsequently uh, moved on to a different position, which is why you get me talking to you today about the data. And what I'd like to do is just share with you first, uh, as the last slide showed, kind of who we were serving within this program, and then just highlight the outcomes that we achieved. And with each of the, the different reports that I'm going to share with you, um, you can see that there are some elements that drove the decisions in terms of who we were serving, how that population was changing, um, and then whether or not we were able to continue to achieve the intended outcomes that we have pulled together for this. So this first slide has lots of information on it, as you might expect when we're presenting the, the demographics uh, of those that were served um, throughout the, the initiative. And I'm going to just hit some of the key highlights just to describe the, the population of people that were being served. So the first thing to note about this slide is that these were the participants in the hospital to home program during the funded period uh, from ACL for the hospital to home program. So that ran from October of 2017 through the end of 2020. So you can see that COVID became part of that as we were moving forward. Uh, in terms of the data that were collected, we had a total of 178 folks that included 112 care recipients and 66 uh, caregivers. And um, I wanna start with the people living with dementia. Uh, so among the people living with dementia, you can see there actually was a not direct even, but um, it's kind of a 60-40 split between females and males. So more females were participating, 67% uh, white, 15% Hispanic, 11% veterans. Um, this is pretty consistent uh, with the, the population of people living with dementia that, that are being served in, in Clark County. Um, we also saw 87% of people who were experiencing frailty. Uh, so you can start to see what uh, Jeff was sharing in terms of the complex needs that people had. And this wasn't just about their dementia or just about dementia and COVID, but there are also other chronic conditions that are impacting their activities of daily living, and frailty is a really good indicator uh, of that. Uh, we also had 32% of people living with dementia who lived alone within the community. I think that's a really important point. Um, particularly when you're thinking about a hospital discharge for a person living with dementia, if they're going back to the, their home where they live by themselves, you really can't rely on a family member or um, a, a volunteer care partner to be providing support. They need the wraparound services uh, that are being developed in consultation between the discharge planners and the care navigators on the team uh, with the hospital to home program. And it also just highlights that when you think about these kinds of initiatives, you really can't think about them just in the context of caregivers, right? I mean, we have a tendency uh, in the, the field of Alzheimer's care and support to put a lot of emphasis on caregivers, as we should, uh, but it's also really important to acknowledge the person living with dementia themselves and the role that they play as a potential care partner uh, within the supports that they're receiving. So I just really want to highlight that. We also, among people living with dementia, had about a quarter of them who were Medicaid recipients, uh, but over half, 56%, fell below the poverty threshold. So really serving a population of people um, with high financial needs as well. The caregivers uh, that were supporting the people living with dementia in the initiative mirrored this to a certain extent, but had some differences. Uh, they were much more likely to be female, you can see, almost 80% of the caregivers were female. Um, and there was a bit more diversity. Uh, only 55% relative to 67 were white and 19% instead of 15 were Hispanic. So there, there was some more um, diversity and some differences between the backgrounds of the person living with dementia and the care partner that was supporting them. Interestingly, uh, and I, I think this relates probably to um, spousal caregivers who are themselves elders, uh, but 
16% of the caregivers were experiencing issues with frailty as well, which I think is important to take note of when you're thinking about the supports that someone is going to receive in the home when they return uh, from the hospital. Also, uh, the same kind of financial issues were there with 40% of the caregivers falling below the poverty level. So that gives you kind of a profile of the people that were being served. Uh, next slide. And then came COVID, right? Uh, and as Jeff uh, alluded to, what we started to see was um, that the burden of rehospitalizations of people living with dementia that is typically experienced within the acute care settings, the hospital settings, uh, was coupled with all of the challenges that came along in the stressors placed on the hospital settings because of COVID. And so to be able to make that shift and start to support people who were um, not only experiencing dementia, but also experiencing COVID and the interrelationship between those became a real priority for this program. And so uh, during that second half of the year, more than a half of the year in 2020, uh, you can see the, the COVID participants that were uh, engaged in this program as well. Um, and of the, the 117 that were tracked during that time uh, as being related to COVID, the, um, about 65% of them, so you can see some of them were in the hospital coming out 41 there at the bottom, 35% um, had no exposure and no quarantine coming out of the hospital, though they had been within a hospital setting in which COVID was like the big concern and the, the major presence, right? It shifted that uh, potential need, but that 65% of the people coming out of the hospital did have some kind of COVID exposure, either through a diagnosis themselves or an exposure with quarantine um, and or, or just the isolation related to having been within that setting. Um, so you can see that COVID really introduced a whole new level of consideration when developing discharge plans for folks and in thinking about how the uh, support team on the hospital at home staff were going to be able to develop the community supports required and give them what they needed uh, in this kind of COVID context that emerged in, in the latter part of 2020. Next slide. Um, and then, then this kind of updates you. These are data from after the uh, completion of the ACL funded element of this grant with this initiative has been sustained uh, as ACL likes for their initiatives to be, right? They will all want to see whether or not it's going to be sustained. And um, you can see that actually as we approach the end of 2022 uh, that the COVID exposures really dropped off quite a bit, um, you know, going from direct COVID 17% uh, to 11%, total COVID from 84 to 43, um, and then the dementia-related elements within that as well, the intersection of COVID and dementia really started to drop off as well. So things, I will say, you know, you hear, oh, well, the pandemic is over. I disagree with that. I mean, if you look at the national data, you can, you know, see that there are still, and this has been this way since about last May, uh, we're still seeing about 2,500 to 4,000 deaths from COVID every week in the United States. And so it's still a present concern. Um, but the impact of COVID on hospital settings and on discharge and support programs such as hospital to home certainly have decreased and, and perhaps are, are leveling off, off kind of to that new normal. Um, but you can just see that dramatic decline. But the, the, the major impact of COVID and its relationship to this dementia-related transition program really was happening throughout 2020, 2021, and then it fortunately has tapered um, in the, the latest data that, that has been collected there. Next slide. I just might add one thing on that. Uh, yeah, just go ahead. You know, this it's amazing to how these percentages have held up, considering that the population that we were serving almost doubled. So when you see these, these percentages, as those quarters are going on, the, the size of the program, the number of people served, goes up by about a third in the, from the first quarter to the second quarter reported, and then by almost another third in the next. So you're looking at the, uh, stratification of a population that's that's going through each of these evolutions we talked about and growing. The caseload right now, just uh, as a, a frame of reference, went from about 35 uh, new cases uh, a month back before the COVID thing hit. Now we're well over 75 new cases a month. 
Peter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that context, Jeff. And uh, so now I'm going to shift into kind of demonstrating the outcomes. And again, these data are from the ACL funded period. So these are the outcomes from the hospital to home program between October 2017 and December 2020. Um, and I want to take one quick step back and just mention, like, why do we do program evaluation, right? There are multiple reasons that you would do program evaluation. Obviously, um, often you want to be able to report data to your funders. Funders like to see the data that you've gathered in evaluating your programs. You may be working on uh, instituting or developing your initiative as an evidence-based program, and so you might be writing peer-reviewed journal articles uh, or other industry publications to get the word out about your initiative. But I think the whole point of this um, webinar today is the another reason, which is that program evaluation and gathering data throughout an initiative while you're delivering it gives you an opportunity to review and analyze those data and then make real-time decisions for program improvements and transitions. And that's really what we were doing with this initiative. And that's the point of this call is that there were some very big changes that took place in the landscape of the, the larger initiative. But then looking at the data and, and the populations of people that were being served, it gave us the information that was needed to be able to shift the service delivery model and expand to cover a broader population of people with different kinds of conditions, i.e. COVID and dementia. Um, and then the question was, well, as we made that shift, were we still achieving the same outcomes? And that's where these outcome data become really important in demonstrating that while those shifts were made because of the changing landscape and the data related to the populations being served, the outcomes were maintained. So with this first outcome, you can see this is around health reported or excuse me, self-reported health status of people living with dementia. Uh, and with this chart, you can see that um, we achieved what we would want to see, which is that the blue bar was baseline at discharge, right? The silver bar is a 30-day follow-up and the green bar is a three-month follow-up. And so you can see that there was a shift uh, from higher uh, ratings of poor and fair with the blue and silver bars becoming green at the three-month follow-up. So self-reported health increased over that three-month period as people were discharged from the hospital uh, and experienced the wraparound supports that were available through the care transitions program, which is exactly what we want to be able to see through an initiative such as this. Next slide. Um, then we have very specific kind of outcomes that we were looking at as well. Depression among people living with dementia was one of those. Uh, so through the, the PHQ-2 that was used uh, to measure these, you can see again, a meaningful decline. And in fact, this was a, statistically significant decline uh, in depression from initial intake to that 30-day follow-up, and then again, a statistically significant decline from 30-day follow-up to the three months. So the wraparound supports that were being provided were helping to reduce the burden of depression among the people that were being supported. Next slide. Similarly, for quality of life, uh, we use the quality D. Uh, to assess this among people living with dementia and, and I should say, and COVID, um, the care recipients. And um, we saw that their quality of life improved. So, you know, uh, shifting from that discharge at a hospital for their hospitalization into 30 days, we saw statistically significant increase in quality of life and saw that again going from 30 days to three months. So it's not just that, okay, their immediate health crisis has concluded and now they're out of the hospital and therefore, uh, you know, their quality of life has increased. That could potentially explain that 30-day bump. But 30 days to three months, that's the sustained impact of the community-based supports that they were getting through those wraparound um, referrals and supports that they're getting through the Care Transitions Program. Moving to the next slide. I, I have the next three slides focus on the care partner experience. So in addition to gathering the data on the outcomes for the care recipients themselves, we looked at the impact on the caregivers as well. Um, and so here we're using the Zarek caregiver burden measure um, and we saw a decline, uh, again, statistically significant declines, both from discharge to 30 days in burden and statistically significant declines from 30 days to three months. So 
a uh, similar situation. The more support they get over time after discharge, moving up to those three months, uh, the better the outcomes become as that impact is sustained. Next slide. Um, now, this is one in which we did not, I will say, see statistically significant declines in depression. So you can see that there is, in terms of the data, there is a quantitative decline um, on the PH2Q scores among the caregivers themselves from 0.49 to 0.24 to 0.13, uh, but, but it, it was not statistically significant. Now, there's probably various explanations for that. The one that I think is most likely is, um, A, that they didn't have particularly high levels of depression at discharge at that point. So if you were to go back to people living with dementia, you'll see that they were like 1.4, 1.5 at discharge versus the caregivers. And so there wasn't a whole lot of room for improvement within that. However, we did see quantitative improvement within that. And perhaps just because of the sample size didn't pop as uh, statistically significant. But we saw did see clinical improvements with this. Next slide. That said, we did see improvements in quality of life for the caregivers that they reported. And it was statistically significant improvements from discharge to 30 days, uh, and then continued improvement, though not statistically significant, from 30 days to three months. So again, we're seeing that sustained improvement over time in quality of life, not only for the care recipient, but also the care partners themselves. Next slide. This is a really fascinating outcome. Uh, it's a, a tool that was um, adopted by, uh, by Jeff and his team at Nevada Senior Services for determining the likelihood of long-term care placement. So they're essentially asking someone, um, you know, whether the, the likelihood that this person living with dementia is gonna move into a nursing home or assisted living community because they can no longer care for them at home in the community. And when they were first asked that at discharge, you can see that it was a fairly high response there. Um, which dropped precipitously as they received the community supports and services of the care transition program. And these were statistically significant changes uh, from intake to 30 days, not significant um, going to three months, but certainly a, a pretty dramatic change nonetheless, even though the p-value didn't pop probably because of the sample size on that. So that intent for long-term care placement becomes not only a care transitions issue in terms of that outcome of rehospitalization, but also that issue of long-term care placement and institutionalization, which of course is another one of the outcomes that we want to try to at least delay, if not avoid. Next slide. And the big drum roll, please. Hospital readmissions are the main point of care transitions programs and uh, the outcome of particular interest. And you can see on this slide um, that while there were some readmissions that took place going from 16 out of 347, right, throughout 2018, 19, and 20, um, those were largely due to a different condition than what they were initially hospitalized for, and that there were, in fact, zero, as Jeff alluded to earlier, uh, zero rehospitalizations for the same condition um, that people had. And so this is a pretty dramatic impact and a pretty big testament to the benefits of these programs and circling back to this idea that the program and, you know, the program changed and evolved and served a broader community. The whole point of these is that the outcomes that were intended for this program developed specifically to support people with dementia transitioning out of a hospital setting were sustained and were accomplished just as vibrantly, if you will, um, for that broader population as the changes were taking place to respond to the COVID pandemic. Next slide. Um, I'm just going to briefly share, you know, these were some of the challenges that were experienced and the, the primary one that was reported uh, at discharge was that folks were concerned they did not have sufficient support at home. You can see other things where they were concerned about community resources, uh, concerned about uh, their ability to engage with their primary care providers and concerned about confusion related to their care plan. Next slide. Those were individual level challenges. There were also sort of the context in which people were being discharged. The primary concerns there being around being able to obtain dementia related care and support services in the community, being able to access dementia education, managing the stress on care partners, 
uh, and concerns about their ability to, to self-manage and have the caregiving skills that they needed. So this is the landscape in which those other discharge challenges were being considered. Now to address those, turn to the next slide, these were the resources and services that were provided in the care transitions program to help to meet those challenges and those needs. You can see a lot of caregiver support going on, a lot of respite care going on, some home modifications to make environmental changes to support success, uh, transportation, home delivered meals, home health. So really thinking about what are the cadre of tools that exist in the community that we can connect people with to help them to succeed in achieving those outcomes that we wanted to be able to achieve. And these are the things that were provided. Next slide. And uh, these are the things that led us to sustainability as the program went through a variety of different transitions. And Jeff, I'm gonna let you talk about kind of the path forward. Well, the data sets you free. The last three slides are, are programmatic learnings over time. And uh, it helped us shape some of the evolutions in terms of understanding who we were taking care of and tr trying to assist and what resources they needed to consume. It also uh, became a way to speak to the folks we hope to contract with for sustainability purposes. So if you think about it, as the population expands, you have enhanced target populations. You see how the data shifts in terms of what that population looks like, what frames them, what resources do they need, what problems do they incur, and uh, what are the most meaningful metrics. And I, I would argue that uh, when you're talking sustainability and you're talking to future partners, you need to understand what metrics they need to hear. And uh, for hospital home, it is most always the readmission rate. And so right now we're at almost 2,500 cases and we've had one readmission for 30 days uh, inside the, for the same diagnosis. And that is just a, a, a mind, if you're in managed care that, or you're a hospital administrator or you're a county funder, that is a major number. Not that these other uh, really important issues that we talk about that frame how we develop and deliver the program aren't important. But if, if you're talking to uh, signing a contract with somebody, you'd better understand how you meet them on the issue that is the driver for them to, to, to entertain that opportunity. So these population shifts allowed us to define who we were serving and then who we could go to to talk about sustainability opportunities. And we identified a number of them. Uh, we continue to have a, a, a grant from Nevada Aging and Disability Services Division for uh, a, a portion of our population. We have a contract with Clark County. Uh, and right now uh, uh, we are uh, up to our eyebrows in work with uh, some of the most difficult populations the county addresses including having a resident team actually at the County University Medical Center, which is the county hospital. We have uh, a self-insured major employer who is looking at us uh, from the perspective of assisting them to get people out of the hospital, but also helping to solve some of the more complex issues uh, that they uh, encourage. And we're watching this data really carefully to see where we go next. And we are have a planning, we just had a planning retreat uh, last Friday. Uh, we have several coming up uh, where we're talking with our leadership team about where that future is. Uh, who should we be talking to? Where are the opportunities to evolve and translate the program? And I, I come back to the fundamental thing I started with, and that is were it not for the flexibility that we had in the first ADPI grant, if this had just been the typical go out and do it grant, we would have never had the iterations that evolved this grant. Uh, we would have never developed some of the data sets that we have because they were complex to develop. And with Peter's help, we were able to put those together. And it actually put us on a path uh, towards both sustainability and program evolution. And so uh, I, I uh, couldn't say enough in terms of a tip of the hat 
for the technical working relationship and supportive relationship we've had with ACL. Uh, and we're, we're hoping that there will be uh, future iterations, evolutions, and sustainability opportunities to come. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much to both of you. We have a few questions that came in that um, I will start to get to. And as you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A pod that's on your screen. Uh, both of the questions that came in so far um, are related to data. So Peter, you might be able to answer these. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the quality of life measure and how it works? Um, some, someone was asking how you measure increase of quality in life. Can you talk a little bit, bit about the quality? You're on mute. Yes, absolutely. So um, the qual AD is a measure, um, I'm kind of looking at my notes here, I, I can tell you that it has um, various items, I don't have that number directly in front of me here, uh, but that provide a range of scores from 13 to 52. And so that was completed as a survey of the care recipients, if they were able to provide information for themselves. And for some, it was completed with a proxy reporting that information on their behalf. So their caregiver was reporting it on behalf of the person living with dementia themselves. And we completed that full survey, both at baseline 30 days and three months um, to be able to track the change in their quality of life over time. And so when you see the scores increase, so for, as I mentioned, the rate was 13 to 52. Um, and as we saw the scores increase, uh, for example, from 28.7 to 30.3 uh, during that zero to 30 days, then that indicates improvement in quality of life. And we had the sample size uh, for those average scores on that measure um, to be able to indicate that they were statistically significant increases in quality of life. Great. That answers Thank the you. question. Yeah, definitely. Um, Jeff, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by respite coaching and if you maintained in-home respite or um, also did respite out of the home? So we built a team of folks uh, that we call respite coaches who are designed to go into the, the home with the social worker and case manager, uh, almost like a SWAT team. The, these folks are uh, very well trained. They get 40 to 50 hours worth of training before they can uh, uh, see client number one, uh, in particularly in the dementia area of uh, helping care, training them to train, help caregivers, assist caregivers with behavior management, with environmental issues and so on. And they spend time in the home, both with the family caregiver, trying to assist the caregiver educationally to, learn things that will help them, uh, including stress reduction and so on, and also letting the caregiver get some respite during that 30-day decompression period as they come out of the hospital. Now, our program lingers beyond that, depending on the case, uh, for up to a total of 90 days where it starts to tail off uh, in the second and third month, where the respite coaches spend less time in the home and the case managers spend less time in the home. But it's designed to, to decompress them. And the folks come from a myriad of different backgrounds. We have nurses, we have uh, uh, certified nursing assistants, we have uh, folks who uh, have been family caregivers themselves. So the, the workforce themselves is a mixed bag, but we have a pretty rigorous training model. Great, thank you. I really like this question. <laughs> who collected all this data? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, which is true. And we talk a lot about with the ADPI grantees about collecting data, the importance of collecting data, how you get people to know it's important. Can you talk a little bit about how you got people to collect all the data and do a good job in that data collection? So data design was an iterative process with Peter and his team. Uh, but, it, but the collection, the, the core collection is actually done by the people in the field. Something they complain about bitterly because it adds to their workload. 
but is incredibly important. And one of the uh, issues we have as an organization is trying to make sure our staff understand why it is important to continue to answer these questions, particularly when they're not required by some brand. And uh, so understanding why it's important and how it gets used at the staff level is really important. And then we continue to have access to Peter and company uh, and we're not uh, uncomfortable about uh, getting advice and counsel uh, about the meaning of the data. Yeah, I just follow up. So to Jeff's point, so we worked collaboratively to A, identify the outcomes that were going to be tracked, B, identify the measures that we were going to use to track those outcomes and then develop the, the tools, the data collection tools that then the program support team, the folks actually delivering the services were trained to administer as part of the program delivery, right? So that happened at discharge and, and um, the entry of people into the program. And then they did the 30 day follow up. They did the three month follow up. Once those data were collected, we had a shared drive where the, the surveys from each of the participants were loaded into that shared drive, which was then accessed by the evaluation team. And we then cleaned the data, analyzed it and reported it. So it was a very collaborative process. Great, thank you. So this, this question kind of follows on what you just said, um, Peter and Jeff. So what kinds of advice can you give um, those who joined us today who might not have access to an evaluator, who may not have access to you know, some kind of data collection system and what kinds of suggestions can you give them to get started so they can gather data that they need to show um, their results and the impact? Do you want to take the first whack or you? Well, my first thought is to be thoughtful about the outcomes that you want to demonstrate. So in other words, you know, really think carefully. If, if you don't have an evaluation team and you don't have people who um, are able to identify measures and analyze data, um, then it's really important that you prioritize. And for a program such as this, right, so speaking just about a care transitions program, that hospital readmission rate becomes a really critical element. And so through delivering the services and the conversations that you're having with people, you would be able to gather information on whether or not they had been re-hospitalized during different time frames. Uh, and then it's a pretty straightforward calculation once you have those data to be able to uh, calculate a percentage against the number of people who you're serving in the program and the number of rehospitalizations that occurred among that population, and then compare that percentage to the norm for your community or the average rates within your community. But it starts with really prioritizing to say, okay, well, we don't have a big data collection infrastructure, but we do know that we want to demonstrate some outcomes. Well, what is that priority outcome? And then what's the best way for you to gather the information and put together a report that demonstrates your impact? So, you really need to have some sort of comparison. And that's where readmission rates are a really good one to think about because there should be good data either for the hospital or for the, the county. You should be able to look at readmission rates and use that as a comparison to the population of people you are serving for that metric. But it starts with prioritization and just being thoughtful about what you want to demonstrate in terms of outcomes. Think about what it is you need to know in terms of who you serve and the way you serve them and who you need to communicate with about what they need to know about your program. And Peter's right on target. Readmission rate is number one, but I do a quarterly report with a lot of these other metrics or at least two of our funders. And I do it, these days I do it on an Excel spreadsheet uh, off client rosters. It's clumsy, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not as sophisticated as having a uh, major database. COVID impacted our ability to do that. We had one and, uh, and COVID and, a, and an attack, a ransomware attack on our system uh, kind of shut that piece down, but we still collect it all, uh, do it the hard way, load it in the spreadsheets, and then, and then analyze it every month. I, I have one quick follow-up comment, though I know we're kind of at the end of time, yeah. um, but I, I have one just general piece of advice that I give to people who are thinking about how to evaluate a program that they're implementing. And that is that you should be measuring outcomes that you would expect to result from the program you are delivering. And you'd be surprised how many times people try to come up with other things that they think should happen. Like, 
in this program, if we had said, oh, well, we want to see whether or not people are going to the great museums that exist in Las Vegas, right? Well, this is not a program about taking people to museums, right? Uh, and so you really need to connect your outcome that you're evaluating to the intent and the purpose of the program and don't try to measure extraneous stuff that's not related to what you're trying to actually achieve. That's very simple advice. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much. So we did reach the end of our time at this point. Thank you everyone for joining us today at the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series. Our next webinar is community-based early dementia screening leads to support for caregivers and people living with dementia. That will be on March 22nd from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. Please keep an eye on your registration information that will come to you via email and contact nadrc-webinars at rti.org if you need more information. We hope to see you there and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.